ora, g'day and welcome to the history of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Episode 77, Working Up a Sweat. This podcast is supported by our amazing patrons, such as Mickey and Quinn. If you want to support Hans, go to patreon.com slash history Aotearoa. Last time, we talked about a variety of Māori sports, including the fast-paced ball sport Ki Orahi. Today, we will talk about a couple more ball games that were played, as well as some other physical games, such as throwing darts and kites. Before we get into that, though, let's talk about games more broadly in Māori culture. The deity that is commonly associated with Taonga Takaro is one that we have seen before, Rokatori or Hine Rokatori. Last time we spoke of her was in the context of Taonga Puro, musical instruments, but she is also the goddess of games and amusement in general, or at least the atua that these aspects of culture are said to have originated from. The entity that games came from changes depending on which iwi you are asking, so like most things, this explanation definitely isn't one size fits all. For example, some stories say they come from the children of Rongo, the atua of cultivated food. Some stories actually roll up both aspects into one, and say that Rokatori is the daughter of Rongo, as games are something that is done during peacetime, which is the other major domain of Rongo. An interesting aspect of how Māori played games was it could be divided up into four main times during the day. There was the time when kids played together, which was basically all day, unless they were old enough to help with daily tasks. Another is when families met together by just popping round for a cup of tea. Then there were large gatherings such as harvest festivals, political meetings, weddings, and the hākari that would go with them. Lastly, there was the specially arranged competitions, where groups would meet up to play a specific game together or a range of games. These weren't hard and fast rules, all of it was rather flexible, but these were the main kind of sections of life where people would play games, and could regularly occur at any time of the day or night. What this meant was that when Europeans arrived, Māori were rather confused. Māori, more or less, played games whenever they felt like. The only thing stopping them was any daily chores that they had going on. Assuming those were done and they had a bit of spare time, they didn't really see any reason not to head out into the field to throw a ball around, or to play a board game in the house at night. Europeans, on the other hand, gave themselves self-imposed restrictions on when certain activities could be performed. The chief among them was not doing any work on Sundays, which, again, Māori were rather confused, as to them, it was just another day. We'll talk more about Māori interaction with Europeans and their sports in another episode, but for now, let's get back to talking about some specific games. Kite is a game with two or more people, and is played with a key power. As you might have gathered from the name, this is a ball made from our native sea snail, power. The key was made by taking two power shells, putting some broken shell inside them, and tying the two together which would mean that when the key power was moved, it would rattle. If power weren't available, stone-filled gourds could be used instead. The game was played with two people, and each player would stand some distance apart and be blindfolded. Each player then must take a step and shake their key power, before taking another step and shaking it again. They can stand still if they choose, but they must shake the key every few seconds. You might already see where this is going, but the object of the game is to find the other player through only using the sound of the rattling, and to be the one to tag them first, before they do the same to you. Best also mentions that this game goes by the name Tio Reo Reo, the handshaking game. Another ball game that Māori played was Tapu Ai. Like Ki Rahi, Tapu Ai was also played on a field, though this one was square. And in fact, many of the names for various areas on the field were the same as those in Kiorahi, though this does vary from region to region. In another similarity, Tapu Ai saw a revival in the 20th century, in particular around World War I. 
The way it's played is with two teams of 7 to 10 players, and with two key, one being thrown to each team by the referee at the start of the game. The key aren't allowed to be kicked or otherwise handled by anything other than the player's hands. The field itself is divided down the middle by a boundary called the kaharanui. This splits the field into three separate parts, essentially two halves, except the area along the centre line, which is counted as its own area, called te ao. This means that there are two kaharanui boundaries a little to the right and left of the centre of the field. I'll put up a diagram in the show notes if you're feeling a bit lost. In each side of the field is a motu, with three tupu, which play a similar role as they do in Kiorahi. Each team is split up into two more groups, which has a different role or mode of play, essentially split into offence and defence. The kitio is the defence side, and has up to three players in their motu, deciding how the tupu are arranged before each set. These players can only stay in the motu, with their job being to defend the tupu from being knocked over, which is how the teams score. If the tupu is hit but stays up, even if it is outside the motu, it doesn't count for a point, and is still considered to be quote-unquote alive. If kitio players get possession of the ball, they will pass it to another group of kitio players who are located in Tiao, in the centre of the field, who then in turn will pass it to their Tanifa players on the other side of the field. The key isn't allowed to cross the Kaharanui boundary without being passed to one of these players in the middle, and each team has a couple of players who perform this task. Every other player is on the Tanifa side of the team, the attacking side. As you probably guessed, these are the guys that the Ketio of the opposing team are trying to stop from scoring, as the Tanifa are trying to knock over the tupu with the key. They're pretty much allowed anywhere on the field, though there are variations of the rules which restrict their movement a bit, based on how many players there are. The idea is to keep the game fast-paced, so sometimes rules variations might say that players are allowed to run with the key, or can only take a step before they must quickly pass it. Tapu Ai is played in sets, so whoever wins the most sets out of a given number, wins the game. The use of stilts was also quite popular across the country. They are known as Po Turu, though they have other names depending on who you ask. They were pretty much what you expected really, a long piece of wood with some sort of footrest coming off it which could either be a natural part of the branch the stilt was made from, or made from another piece of wood and lashed onto the main piece. These footrests could be set quite high up on the stilt if the person was particularly adept at using them, between one and one and a half metres. Stilts were used in all sorts of games, such as racing across land, wrestling, or even racing across bodies of water, including rivers and the sea. Apparently, stilt walking was prevalent across the Pacific, but most Europeans didn't take much notice, so there isn't a lot of information from their end regarding it. As you might have gathered from listening to these episodes, a lot of pastimes that we now see as being very Kiwi have very old origins in Te Ao Māori. So it might not come as too much of a surprise that probably one of the most quintessentially Kiwi summer pastimes probably has its roots in Te Ao Māori. Tobogganing, or sledding if you're American. Well, tobogganing in and of itself isn't specifically a Kiwi thing per se. We do see its presence all over the world in various forms, but most often it involves sliding down snow, which is something we don't get that much of here in Aotearoa. Instead, something we do a lot today is sled down sand dunes, usually on cardboard or something similar, and it seems that pre-European Māori were also a really big fan of this. There were of course some differences, such as that they probably did it down hills with water thrown on them, but also the fact that they didn't have access to cardboard for their toboggans. Instead, they would get some wood and carve it to specifications, usually about 18 centimetres wide and 80 centimetres in length, with a raise in the front where you could put your feet. Occasionally, this raised part would have some extra decorative carving on it with PowerShell, especially if the carving depicted a face. 
To keep the passenger on board, there were a couple of different safety options. One was to have a cord through the raised part that they could hold on to. The other was to just have a peg in front that they could grip. Usually a toboggan was made to hold only one person, but there were some that were made to hold two, which naturally were larger. As you might expect, racing toboggans down hills was a big pastime among children, and Best mentions that there was a handicap system for these races, but he doesn't elaborate on what this might have involved. Occasionally, things would get a bit more interesting if you had a hill that was next to a body of water, which was the case in one particular instance. During high tide, the kids would slide down the hill and try to get as far as they could by skimming across the water, not too unlike skipping a stone across the surface. Throwing darts, although at first blush may sound the same as spear throwing, is actually very different. These darts were about a metre in length and made from hawama wood, or could be made from stalks of flax. But either way, some harakeke leaf was added to the end which would ensure that they had a blunt knob. This would seem like it was designed to avoid injury, but it doesn't really make much sense since spear throwing was already a thing. So why bother adding this safety feature if the more dangerous alternative is already culturally accepted? Well, it had to do with how they were thrown. Or rather, bounced. When going to throw the darts, an area that was clear of obstructions would be chosen, and a small mound of dirt made up. Participants would stand about 10 metres behind the mound, and take a running start to throw the ticker, dart, at the mound. The idea was to bounce the dart by its blunt end off the mound and make it continue flying, rather than just tossing it as far as you could. The person who threw slash bounced it the furthest wins. Manu tukutuku, kites, were quite a large part of pre-European Māori culture. So much so that they were a big part of one of the most important events in the Māori calendar, Matariki, or the Māori New Year. We talked a bit about kites in episode 15 when we talked about Matariki in detail, so if you want to know more about their use in that context, you can go listen to that episode. For now, let's talk about kites more broadly. They came in a variety of shapes, sizes and designs, and were used for all sorts of different purposes, including entertainment, ceremony, or even in battle, which I think is rad as hell. Manu tukutuku could also be used as an aid for fishing, using them to kinda kite surf when attached to a waka, or to send messages over long distances. They could also be used as boundary markers, indicating where someone's land ended and another's began, though it's not clear whether they were used in the sky or just on the ground as a physical marker, as I suspect that boundary markers that were less prone to being destroyed by high winds were more popular. As you might expect from such a significant cultural item, kites are found throughout Māori stories and legends such as Tawhiki trying to follow Tangotango into the heavens on a kite, or Maui who uses kites to fly over land. Both of these stories obviously involve people, or entities, using the kite as a means of transport by riding them. Although, in reality, someone couldn't use a manu tukutuku to fly into the sky or travel long distances, it did have some real-world precedent, which we'll talk about in a bit. Like many crafts, being able to spot and select the best materials, reciting the appropriate karakia or waiata, the construction and learning to fly a kite, and perform various moves, were all highly regarded as worthwhile and impressive skills. In fact, people who were quite skilled with flying kites could perform all sorts of moves, such as spins, banks, and even stall their kites in both light and strong winds. As for their construction, manu tukutuku could be made from all the usual suspects. Ti, manuka, raupo, upoko, toitoi, harakeke, kiekie, and niko, among others. 
Toy Toy, Manuka, Harakeke, and Ropo were the most popular materials, likely due to a combination of being readily available in many different areas, as well as their own individual properties in construction. Oute, paper mulberry, was also popular where it was available. You may recall it was mostly restricted to the warmer regions of the Upper North Island. These must have been fairly significant, because apparently kites made from Ote were only flown by men of high rank. Not all kites were very extremely serious though. Some were just made for fun, and didn't really have much ceremony or tapu around them. But those that were used in various religious circumstances, or for divination, obviously had quite a lot more protocols to follow during their construction. When not in use, manu tukutuku, especially the larger ones, were usually housed in a special building, called the Tafaro manu tukutuku, and it could be pretty big, up to 15 metres long. Inside, the kite would be placed on a platform, likely to maximise the space, and probably to keep it dry. When the kite was to be flown, it would be brought out the night before and left outside overnight to allow the morning dew to come on it and make it a bit moist. This was so that when it was used the next day, it wouldn't be super dry and fragile. It would have a bit of flex to it and not snap immediately. Kites were, of course, widely enjoyed by kids. Children's kites tended to be smaller and more easily manipulated, often being made of ropo. Manu tukutuku were actually popular throughout the Pacific, not just in Aotearoa, as well as those used in Europe. William Colenso, yes, that William Colenso, notes that the kites Māori used were much different to the ones used by Europeans, as the ones made in Aotearoa tended to be more similar to the ones found in China. This would make quite a bit of sense, since Māori, Polynesians, and essentially every group of people who can trace their whakapapa to the Pacific are descended from people who came from Southeast Asia thousands of years ago. Best doesn't really agree with this though, saying that Chinese kites resembled birds more than Māori ones did, with the latter more being a hybrid between birds and humans. But let's get back to how kites were used in battle, as I'm sure you are wondering what that actually involved, just as I did when I first read it. Within that though, we're going to talk about how manu tukutuku were also used for divination, as that was a part of how they were used in warfare. In particular, if a toa, a war party, were about to attack a pa, they would make a kite from toy toy under heavy tapu. This meant anyone involved in making the kite wasn't allowed to eat during its construction, among other restrictions such as the rope being made from unprocessed harakeke. The idea was that the kite was flown under the guidance of Tu Matoinga, the Atua of war, and was meant to gain his aid in the coming battle. As such, breaking tapu would offend him and possibly bring defeat. The construction and flight of the manu tukutuku would be directed by a tohunga, with them flying it themselves with their right hand. If they forgot to do this and otherwise used the left hand, that would be a tohu that they would lose the battle. This was also the case if the kite flew a bit lopsided. In contrast, if the kite flew upright and straight, it was taken as a sign that they would see victory. During the flight, the tohunga would recite some karakia as well, and once this was complete, the people who had made the kite, who had been fasting at this point, were now able to eat. This was usually the point where anyone else present would leave the tohunga to do their thing, as they could do the rest themselves. The rest was that the tohunga would make a ring of toy toy leaves and put it onto the line, the wind sending it up towards the manu tukutuku. This was a karere, a messenger, though Best doesn't say what the message was or what it was intended for, though I would hazard a guess that it was something asking for Tu's favour. This was a fairly common practice when using Manu Tukutuku for divination, occasionally using multiple Harakeke rings instead. The ring could also be made of wood and have feathers on it too. Once the Kariri had reached the kite, 
the whole thing would be released over the par they were about to attack. The flax rope would trail underneath and would be long enough that it would be basically touching the ground, which was especially a problem when it flew over the par, as everyone desperately tried to avoid touching it. It was believed that touching the harakeke would instill the power of the enemy tohunga into that person. Which kinda sounds like a good thing, but that tohunga was gonna try and kill you in about 20 minutes, so you probably didn't want them having any influence over you. Additionally, touching the rope would mean that those in the pa would surely be defeated. Often for those inside a pa, the first sign that there was an incoming assault was a kite flying over them, which would be trying to touch anyone within the walls. The other way that Manu Tukutuku were used in warfare was to get water and food to besieged allies, allowing the kite to carry the supplies into the pa to help them survive longer until a relief force arrived. There are also reports of people using the kites to lift themselves off the ground and enter a fortified pa, or alternatively, escape one that was under siege. Kites could be used for a bit of deception as well, with one story telling how some kites were built and moved to resemble seagulls, tricking the enemy into thinking that there were currently lots of fish in an area of sea. They then left the pa to go catch those fish, but instead fell into the trap that the kite makers had set. There are many different types of manu tukutuku, usually named manu and then whatever the kite was depicting or meant to represent, such as manu fiki, which has long flowing tentacles like an octopus, or the manu tangata, which looked like a person. Some were even given the names of tipuna if they were particularly important. We won't talk about all the different kinds, because there really was quite a lot of them, and Best goes into a fairly deep amount of detail on each one, but here are a few that caught my eye. Manu Paititi were made in the shape of flounder, and were apparently not too difficult to make, but Best notes that the proper quote-unquote charm was needed to ensure that they flew well. This wasn't uncommon when making kites, as karakia would sometimes be said when they were flown to stop them from getting tangled with other kites, or to ensure that they descended gracefully and didn't crash. Manukaka were designed to look like the kaka bird. They had a frame of manuka stalks which had toy toy flowers attached. The kite was then covered in the orangey reddy feathers of the actual kaka to complete the effect. Manurere were more generally bird-shaped kites that represented birds as a food source, so they were held in high regard by those more inland hapu that relied heavily on them for sustenance. The kite would have a central body with two outstretched wings and some sort of tassels out the back that would flutter around, presumably representing a tail. These kites were fast and able to dart around and be manoeuvred quickly, if the person was skilled enough. They would often be used to lure birds into traps, or as a competition between people to see who could imitate bird movements the best. So the whole idea of these kites was really to have the best replica bird. Manu Tangata were among the largest kites, with a potential wingspan of 10 to 20 metres, meaning they could require multiple people to operate. Or, more likely, they needed a few people to keep it on the ground, because if only one person operated it, they would just fly off. They did have enough lift to pull a person, or even multiple people, off the ground, so it was a possible danger. Some of these could even have wings or perhaps arms that flapped as well. Interestingly, Manu Tangata possibly had a far-reaching influence into the future. Richard Pierce, the Kiwi who may have invented powered flight before the Wright brothers, allegedly based his plane design on that of the Manu Tangata. As you should be aware by now, Kite flying for fun, sport, ritual, warfare, and basically every other reason reduced significantly after European arrival. Much like other sports and aspects of Māori life, Manu Tukutuku were also victims of missionary conversions and subsequent disdain, among other forms of colonisation. However, 
there has been a more concerted effort since the 1980s to bring them back into more widespread use, which only seems to be gaining more and more traction as Matariki also increases in popularity as a holiday, particularly with it becoming a national public holiday in 2022. Next time, we will be moving away from physical, body-intensive games to ones that are more brain-intensive, often involving speech and memory as key components. If you want to send me feedback, ask a question, suggest a topic, or just have a chinwag, you can find my email and social media on historyaotearoa.com. Aotearoa spelt A-O-T-E-A-R-O-A. You can also find helpful resources there, like transcripts, sources, and translations for some of the te reo Māori we have used. You can help support Hans through Patreon, buying merch, or giving us a review. It means a lot, and helps spread the story of Aotearoa New Zealand. As always, haeritu atu, hoki tu mai. See you next time.